my mom's side of the family passed away uh, from COVID back in early, well, early pandemic. And um, there's a family gray plot out there, which is um, basically what the whole trip was about, a big family trip out there to um, inter her remains but um we like we're heading out there might as well make it a vacation as well so it's kind of one somber day but um me and my wife uh, i have a twin brother so my my brother and his wife and then my mom my aunt and uncle um yeah yeah we went out there for a couple of weeks and it Wait, was fantastic. you have a twin brother i do identical twin brother oh, okay um, i didn't yeah, know that nice. Or maybe you mentioned it and I'm just, uh, just (laughs) my bad, sorry. (laughs) No, no, it makes for some interesting times. Um, I actually, back when I was working for um, uh, one of the SolarWorks partners, uh, Javelin in Canada, I actually got called in to do a process assessment at his company while he was on vacation. Um, Mm -hmm. And it was just chaos, everybody. He he wasn't in the office and then suddenly his identical twin shows up in uh, (laughs) a Javelin shirt and starts, um, uh, there there was a lot of confusion. I actually got dragged into an engine, like walking down the hallway. um, Suddenly a boardroom door opens and it's like, hey, John, we need you to get in here. And I'm like, "Uh, uh, uh," and they're asking me questions already. I didn't, it took about a minute of waiting for them to explain something until I'm like, Sorry, guys, I'm actually not John, if you couldn't tell by the shirt and the name tag. And like, no, I'm uh, I'm his twin. Um, by the way, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, you're no. talking about your vacation. I hope that was fun. Oh, it was. It was really good. We uh, had a lot of seafood. Um, I saw some amazing beaches. There's some of, the, some of the nicest beaches I've been to actually anywhere. And there. you said this was a few weeks back, right? La- last month. Is yeah, this was last month. And it was oh, also the weather weeks. there, by the way beautiful uh we actually we were mid-september i want to say september 13th was the last beach day that we did and like to be um swimming in the atlantic ocean in canada um in mid-september <laughs> it's wild for me but it, it was gorgeous um and then the hurricane hit hurricane um uh, fiona hit two oh, days right. yeah. it, just before hurricane ian hit the states um yeah, we had a big one up in Canada, and it was kind of wild. We restaurants that we had eaten at like two weeks, it, two weeks ago. You're seeing news footage, and it's like, oh wow, it's it's underwater. Um, places where we were walking down the beach beside the restaurant, it's like you can't even see the beach anymore. It's just water with buildings popping up out of it. Um, wow, that's, so, that's yeah, it hits, yeah, it hits differently when it's somewhere you've uh, you've just been. Um, how about yourself? Have you guys uh, done any vacations this summer? Yeah, we, I went to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, which which was uh, which was awesome, which was really beautiful. Uh, we probably not this fall to see the fall colors, but we we plan to go back to the Upper Peninsula and see some colors probably next year. So fingers crossed on that. Um, it's 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 awesome. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. We went to the Pitcher Rocks uh, National League Shore and did a hike. Um, so it was it's fun. That's awesome. Fun times. Um, are you excited for the uh, Formula One this weekend? Oh Japan, yeah, the, the Japanese Grand Prix. Yeah, yeah, I am. Um, yeah, Suzuka is Suzuka is one of uh, one of the best tracks on on calendar, and I I always look forward to. Uh, you know, watch this race. This is fun. It's going to be fun tomorrow. I hope so. Who are, uh, you got any bets on who's going to win it? Uh, well, no, 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 no <laughs> bets, really, to be honest. Uh, but let's see. I mean, I think uh, if, if Max wins, um, he, he probably also has a chance uh, to, to take the championship, if, if yeah. I'm not wrong. But yeah, Suzuka had, um, you know, so much, um, you know, good races in the past as well. I don't know if you you mentioned you recently started, uh, um, you know, following F1, right, Peter? Yeah, just about uh, a year ago, it was the drive to survive that got me into it. Oh, yeah. Um, Yeah, yeah. yeah, we, I, I had tried to get into f1 a few years back probably like five years ago um and just never uh yeah drive to survive kind of brought me right back into it now so i got a f1 tv i would i would recommend you watch uh a youtube video this is uh fernando alonso overtaking michael schumacher in in what is one of the fastest corner on the calendar like 200 miles per hour flat out left-hander um 
yeah, it's it, they call it 130R. That's that's uh, uh, they they have it, you know, towards the final section uh, on 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 the Suzuka racetrack. So it is it is yeah. Just why it, I believe it is from 2006, so maybe 2005, I guess. Oh, uh, so yeah, that's that's fun. I will definitely check it out. I think yeah. we're actually live, guys. So oh yeah, are we are we live? Yeah, that's... we are. Well, so everybody, welcome to my session. Uh, I'm hoping you can see my screen all right in our first um, uh, introduction to the presentation. What we'll do, um, let's talk a little bit about what we're going to show today. So uh, we're going to talk about simulation and collaboration all on the 3D Experience platform. And uh, we'll start with some introductions, guys. Uh, I'm Peter Chubbleton. I'm one of the industry process consultants here on the simulation team at Dassault Systems. Um, I work with customers and uh, our partners across North America and worldwide to um, provide support and help around the, uh, the 3D Experience platform and simulation solutions that we have. So I'm here with my colleague Shreyas Vijay today, and uh, I'd like to, yeah, Shreyas, if you want to introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. So my, my name is uh, Shreyas Vaidya. First of all, yeah, welcome everyone. Uh, super, super excited to be here with you all today. And uh, yeah, we, we have some uh, really good simulation content coming your way. But as, as Pete mentioned, right, we, uh, we as uh, industry process consultants, we work together here in North America. We work with all our amazing partners and we, uh, we, we basically try and address all our customer needs uh, when it comes to engineering simulation. Exactly. And one of the things we're going to cover today, we want to talk about simulation, obviously, and we've got some cool things to show you, but we also want to talk about how we collaborate using the 3D Experience platform, because um, we're not anywhere near each other geographically. I'm up in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Shreyas is in West Lafayette, Indiana. And if I zoom in on this Google map here, um, it's about a 28-hour drive for Did me to get down plan to, to drive from there, Peter? Uh, one day, one day I will definitely come down to see you and we can hang out, but um, not anytime soon. That's not a drive I would look forward to. Uh, so what we do, we use a variety of tools um, such as uh, Skype, Zoom, um, things like that to collaborate, but we also use the 3D Experience platform. And, and we're going to try and highlight as we go through this today, all the different ways and all the different tools that we have that help us collaborate on a day-to-day -day basis and can help you guys collaborate with your designs. And, um, let's just give a brief overview of what we're going to look at today. Um, we're going to talk about simulating something that I think everybody has, and then we want it to kind of get a common thread that people could connect with. And I think that's a smartphone. Um, I would almost guarantee everybody on this call right now, whether it's in your phone, uh, whether it's in your hand, your pocket or on your desk, everyone's got a smartphone. So I'd like to start with modeling a cell phone and then we'll actually simulate. Uh, we're going to do this all on the uh, 3D experience platform in the X apps because I think we've talked enough in the past about how you can bring in SOLIDWORKS models onto the 3D Experience platform. Everyone's aware of it. It works very well. It stays very connected. But what about starting on the 3D Experience platform? So we're going to model this entirely in X-Design on the 3D Experience platform. Then we'll simulate a snap test of it. So actually snapping that case onto the phone. And then Shreyas is going to show some really exciting stuff about drop testing a phone and not just dropping it once, but dropping it multiple times. Um, and this is actually a good time to, to talk about um, where are we right now? What is this screen that I can zoom in and out of? Um, we're actually in the 3D Experience platform on a web browser right now. If I unfull screen this, we can see I'm actually in Google Chrome on the 3D Experience platform. And we're in an app called 3D Lean, um, which was originally designed for lean manufacturing, but is a really good tool for collaboration. And it really lets us set up these live views um, where we can both collaborate in here. So this is how we planned out the entire presentation. We can both be in here adding notes, um, adding comments and stuff at the same time. No worries about sending PowerPoint slide decks back and forth to each other over email and, and things like that. So um, what I'll do, I'll pass it over to Shreyas to walk us through um, a little bit more of an overview of what we're gonna see today. Yeah, sure. Sounds good. So uh, this is this is what the agenda looks like today. As as Peter mentioned, we'll we'll try our best to stay on the platform, use all the collaborative apps that are available on the platform, 3D 3D Lean that you see here on the screen, or um, 3D Play, 3D Swim, uh, which are basically team communities that you can use to collaborate. 
uh, with with your colleagues and teammates, right? Uh, Peter's gonna go next with the with the snap fade. He'll uh, he'll show you the whole workflow where he's bringing in his design from from the X apps X design to be to be more specific, and uh, which is which is again a web based uh, design application and get those designs from a web browser onto his native simulation application, perform a snap fit analysis, show you all the model setup process. Uh, we'll, we'll try and collaborate using uh, the physics simulation review, uh, show you what, what these applications are all about, how, how uh, efficiently you can collaborate using these applications. And uh, once, once Peter is done with this uh, part of the presentation, we'll, we'll switch gears a bit I want to show you some exciting uh, advanced capability, which we call a preloaded frame or a preloaded mesh, uh, which lets you set up a downstream analysis based on your upstream results. Um, so we'll, we'll uh, take a look at a simple workflow, as Pete mentioned. We'll, we'll drop a phone, we'll drop it multiple times, and, and see uh, you know what are some of the parameters we can um, you know take out of these analyses. We'll finally do a quick recap with uh, a very high-level overview of uh, the products or the roles that we will be using in this session. And uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about structures and fluids, uh, and then some of the solutions that we have to offer here on the platform. And what are some of their advanced capabilities that now SolidWorks users can leverage to to improve your uh, improve their designs and then make make the workflow more efficient? Peter's going to uh, give us a very high level overview of the electromagnetic solutions that we have for uh, our SolidWorks users. With that being said, I, I think we can get started. Uh, Peter, uh, what do we got today? All right. Well, I will. Uh, I will take it away from here, and we'll start talking about some design. But before we do that, I just want to say, if you guys are just joining us, um, please like and subscribe so you get this content. Um, that you're subscribed, and, and you'll be uh, available to see the future sessions of this. And also, be sure to uh, share your questions in the chat. We can see that chat window, and we will try and answer those questions as they come up, guys. Um, now, uh, we have one question already, which is, is this only relevant to models made in the X apps, or is it available to, or relevant to SOLIDWORKS CAD models as well? Um, the only thing we're doing in XApps is actually designing the geometry. And once we have geometry, it doesn't matter where it came from, whether whether that geometry came from SOLIDWORKS or came from uh, one of the X apps, like X Design or X Shape, once we bring it into simulation, the ex the process is exactly the same. So this is just as relevant if you're using SOLIDWORKS data. Um, you could easily model up the same case in SOLIDWORKS, and you'll see that in a moment. So without further ado, let's talk about designing a phone in a web browser on one of these X apps. And we're going to do this with the 3D Experience platform, again, where I am right now. So um, I've talked about this 3D Lean app that we're using to plan this. I can actually pop over to X Design, and this is the actual CAD tool on one of the CAD tools on the 3D Experience platform. But rather than making you guys watch me design this live, I actually have a short video that I'll show because this is really on simulation and collaboration, not modeling and X Design. There's tons of great videos around that. So one of the things I like about X Design, this took about 10 minutes to model. By the way, I've just sped it up about 10 times. Um, one of the things I really like about it is that it's kind of a, a freeform modeling tool where you get, uh, you're less constrained. You don't need to worry about, are, are you designing a part? Are you designing an assembly in context parts within an assembly? Um, you just start creating geometry and you can worry about what to do with it later. So I started by modeling just a, a dummy model of a cell phone. Um, and then I made that a part within the assembly. Um, I didn't even know I was gonna start with an assembly, but that's how it, it turned out. Then I started modeling modeling the case right within the same file. I can reference the existing edges um, of the phone, and then I'll turn the phone into its own um, part as well, or, or what we call a physical product. So we essentially have created a two-part assembly very quickly, all within one file on the fly. And um, I've added some little cutouts on the side there. Uh, just I, I can say they're for weight reduction or something, but really it's, it's to make it look a little cooler. And that's the final design. So that's what modeling this looked like. And again, it's all done in a web browser. It's literally this window right here. This is my X Design app live. So 
Now that we have a model created, let's talk about simulating snap fitting that plastic case. And uh, right now I've got this made at about nine millimeters above the bottom of the case. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to bring this into one of the simulation apps. We're going to uh, set up the model and then we're going to simulate snapping this by pushing the phone down nine millimeters into the case. So um, how do I do that? Well, the nice thing with the platform, it is all connected and it's connected through this compass. Now, I mentioned that this is in a web browser right now and we still are in a browser, but some of these apps are browser based, what we call X apps. Other ones are what we would call native apps. And they're like a traditional Windows program that gets installed on your computer. Some of the simulation apps uh, that, that are do a little more heavy lifting than you can do in a web browser are these native apps. And I could start this right now just by saying, okay, let's grab my uh, assembly model here, click on the compass, and I could grab any of these apps, model assembly design, mechanical scenario creation, et cetera. But there's also another way I can do that that I'd like to show you. I'm just gonna split screen this right now. I have one of my native apps open on this screen. So uh, this is the 3D experience platform on desktop. Still the same thing. I still have a compass up here, exact same layout. And as I mentioned, that's kind of what connects these two platforms. So I can actually drag this right into my native app. It takes just a second to kind of load that geometry up and then I can start setting it up. And um, what's neat about this, I just dragged a file from a web browser into a desktop program um, very, very quickly. And uh, you, you can see how seamless that is. So even though it's a desktop app, it's still connected to the cloud and it's still connected to um, uh, the original geometry that I'm working on. So let's start setting this up. Uh, this, when I drag in a physical product into my native apps, I start in model assembly design. And we're going to start setting up um, just some of the, um, and some of the mesh and some of the pre setup before we get into setting up the simulation scenario. So what I'll do here, I'm just noticing my taskbar is showing. I'll see if I can get that to hide. Come on taskbar, get out of the way. That's better. Sometimes Sometimes it clicks up like that. So there's multiple ways we can design meshes in here. And um, what we'll do today, we're gonna use what we call an automated FEM. And, and this is a nice way to do it. It's not really required for a two-part assembly, but it um, we'll talk a little bit more about it once I start going. So what I can do with an automated FEM, I can go in and define my finite element model or FEM for each of my parts very quickly. And I can do that with rules or procedures. So for the phone itself, I'm going to choose a tetrahedron mesh here, and we're going to set this to maybe two millimeter elements for the phone. And I'll choose quadratic elements, I'll click OK. Then I'll go into my case itself, um, and I'll also apply a tetrahedron mesh. Let's do maybe a little bit smaller on the case. We'll start with one mil geometry on there, also quadratic. And now I could run this. So. Why would I do this? Why would I set up a procedure and then run it? Well, for a two-part assembly, there's not really any speed savings here, but what this would let me do, if I had a very complex assembly um, with lots of parts, I can set up various different mesh procedures for my different parts, one, uh, some for sheet metal, um, uh, some for solid geometry, etc. cetera. Um, but you can also use what we call meshing rules there. And those mesh rules um, let me go in and specify some very detailed rules around meshing, like for example, around various holes, if I need a certain element size or if I need a certain number of layers of elements kind of progressing outwards around that hole, I can set up all of these rules and it turns my meshing into something very automatic. Once you've set up a rule-based scheme, you can mesh a very complex assembly in literally one click. You click run, it's going to mesh everything for you. So uh, we have another question that came in, which is how to design live in the web browsers. Can we design in web browser by iPad? Yes, you can. Um, any device that has a browser on it that you can load up, um, uh, basically pull up a web page on, you can use to design in X apps. So Peter, so, about the mesh rules. So let's say you have those hexagonal uh, uh, shapes on, on your case, right? So with, with mesh rules, what I can do is uh, I can say, okay, these are these are some of the critical areas of my design, and I can uh, I can set up rules so that it fine meshes those regions, those faces, or those edges. So that's that's basically what a what a mesh rule would would help you establish. Exactly. So we can see that this is meshed, and let's have a quick look. 
edit. So we'll have a look at these two parts. And what I might do, um, even though I've used automated meshing, that's not the only mesh control that I have. If I'd like to go in and let's say make a little bit of a finer mesh on that case, I can. And, and you know what, before I do that, I may just check um, a few things here. I'm going to check what we call the Contributing Shapes Manager. I'm just going to make sure uh, that this has actually created an individual mesh in each of my parts. So there's a mesh in the case, there's a mesh in the phone, and it's created a top-level mesh. We're using a technique called assembly of meshes here, where you have a top-level mesh that references those other ones. I'm just going to make sure that my top-level design is referencing those two parts. And I will make sure, in this case, it's super easy uh, because I've only created these three meshes. I can see my top level mesh is referencing these two. I only have the three. So I've meshed 16, 17, referencing 16, 18, and 16, 19. Yep, that's what I see. But you can have multiple meshes for multiple parts that you might use for different things. So you do have the option to select those or choose the right ones. Well, I, was, I, was, I was just going to say that, Peter, if, if, if we have multiple parts, we have the ability to have mul uh, you know, different meshes on each single part, let's say if I'm using different elements, right, different element formulations. So I can have different finite element models of one specific part, and then whichever one I want to use uh, in my simulation, I can basically reference it in the top level assembly of the meshes. Exactly, exactly. And, and yeah, so there's a lot of flexibility around that. But now that I'm in the, um, uh, now that we've matched it, maybe what I'd like to do, there's a little snap fit edge here, the edge that actually snaps onto the, uh, or lip that snaps on around the phone. Maybe I'd like a finer mesh there. Well, I can just jump down to my mesh, double click on it, and, and this is exactly how I specify my global mesh size, but I can also say, let's do some local meshing in here. And I might use half millimeter elements here, so about half the size we had previously. And I get some great selection tools. I'll just go in and turn on my propagate feature. When I grab this edge, you'll see I have the option to propagate by a bunch of different options here, by angle, by path, by tangency. I'm gonna choose tangency. And we'll see that grabs that whole edge for me. So I'll go in, I'll say half mil elements with no sag. So basically no tolerance on that. And we'll click okay. And I'll just click mesh. This will remesh the model, and it's a fine difference in here. It's not a huge difference in mesh size, but it is going to make that a little bit smaller. And we can just verify that. I'll just zoom in. And yeah, we're about half the size down here. We have two elements. We have one element up top. So that worked perfectly. What we'll do now, we'll talk about applying materials. And on the 3D Experience platform, that's done through solid section properties. And what I mean by that, I can pop into each of these parts. And when I did the automatic mesh, it's automatically created the solid section for my phone. Um, I'll just double click. This lets me go in and assign a material. So I can browse for materials through my material palette. And I'd like to do a 6061T6 here. So I'm gonna browse uh, for 6061T6 material. There we are. I just grab it. I can see all of the simulation properties associated with it as well. Um, we'll just go back and select that again. And OK. Now, another neat note, we have multiple material behaviors. Uh, I'm not expecting plasticity here. Um, uh, hopefully, the, <laughs> the case deforms before the phone does. But uh, I can include that option. And I'll do the same thing here for my case material. I'll go into the case. Now I'll search for materials again. We have a custom material that we've created here for this case, and I've just called it case material. Again, I can just search for case. Okay, I found it. There we go. And I will apply it and click OK. The final thing I need to do is set up what we call a coupler because I mentioned I'd like to uh, push this phone downwards into the case. And, and you know, I don't have to apply a coupler. I could do a load directly, but you'll see why I want to do a coupler here. I'm gonna create a coupling on the top face. I'll just say it's a kinematic coupling. And what this does, it actually links all of the nodes on that top face to a center point. And it's basically like a rigid connection. I now have a single point that I can use to control that entire face. And that's where we're gonna start applying our loads uh, or displacements to in this case. Well, with this, all of my model setup is done and I'm going to jump right into setting up the simulation scenario. Again, it's all through the compass on the 3D experience platform. So I'll grab the compass. I'm going to start my mechanical scenario creation app. And again, I don't need to change windows here. It actually launches it. It just changes over to this mechanical scenario creation. I'm going to call this maybe a uh, Peter Live Design Snap 
something like that. I'll say it's a structural simulation. And there's other options there too, thermal, thermal structural, et cetera. Uh, and I'll just choose the finite element model that we just set up previously. This now starts me into setting up the simulation. So I can see it's created a structural analysis case in my tree. And the first step is to tell it what we'd like to do. And in this case, I can choose various different steps. We could do a static step, um, an explicit dynamic step. We could do a frequency step to extract the um, uh, natural frequency modes of the part. We'll just do a static step. So we'll choose static here. Um, set my initial time increment to a very small number. I'll go, I'll go 0.01. And if you guys are wondering what this is, if you, this is your first time looking at nonlinear analysis, it's not real time. It's what we call pseudo time. So it's basically using one second as a, you could think of that almost as a percentage where one second is your final percentage. So we're starting out at 0.01. We're basically starting with a 1% load step of our, our total time. Now, these nonlinear static steps can get a little unstable at times, so I'm going to turn on some damping stabilization. This is just using the, the automatic settings for um, uh, damping, but what it does, this applies some damping to the model, but it also lets you set a tolerance. And what is an energy ratio tolerance? Well, that's actually comparing the damping energy to the total strain energy in the model and making sure the damping doesn't have too much of a contribution, and it, it actually updates that continuously through the analysis. And finally, I'm going to change my matrix storage to unsymmetric. What is that? Well, it has to do with uh, how the solver handles the stiffness matrix in the analysis. And unsymmetric takes a little bit longer to solve. It's a little bit more computationally intensive, but it makes less assumptions. And unless you're positive you have a symmetric stiffness matrix, this is a, a safer option to use. So I'll set that up. Um, we've now created that step. And the next thing I might do is actually define some contact properties. So let's pop over to interactions and I'll define a contact property. This is where I could go in and specify my friction coefficient. And do we want to run this with friction, Shreyas, or do you think we should go no friction? Yeah, let's let's go no friction first. Let's see. Let's keep it. We safe. can always change it later. Yeah. Um, so again, I get options for normal behavior as well. I'm going to change into a uh, just a penalty enforcement for, for this. Again, just some settings. We won't spend too much time on it, but uh, just to sort of help this work a little bit better. Now, I'll click OK. That set up a contact property. And now I'm going to turn on one of my favorite features, which is general contact in 3D experience. And this is one of the features we have in, in Simolia Abacus that, that really helps um, speed up your analysis. If you've done some simulation in SOLIDWORKS, you're familiar with contact sets. You've gone in and defined source and target faces. And with complex models, you've probably spent a lot of time developing those and, and swapping source and target faces and then things like that. Um, general contact is like a SOLIDWORKS no penetration global contact on steroids. Um, it will do realistic no penetration contact everywhere on the model. Um, and literally, it's one click. I turn it on. I can pick whatever friction or contact property I've chosen. I click OK and it just works. I don't have to worry about contact at all through this analysis. So let's go in and set up our actual loads right now. I'll go into my loads, uh, or actually boundary conditions here. We're going to do an, uh, oh, you know what? Before we actually apply the translation, I need to tell um, the 3D experience platform how I'm holding this. We're gonna clamp the bottom face just to basically simulate having this case on a table, something like that, and we'll snap the phone down into it. It's like a fixed restraint. Now I will apply a translation, and this is where I could choose the face, but sometimes you can accidentally select individual nodes, edges, things like that. This is where the coupling comes in. I can actually say as a, basically, instead of choosing a face, I can browse, grab that coupling, and this is already linked to that entire face. So I'll choose the coupling. I'll say we're going to go nine millimeters, but actually I see the arrow going upwards there. I want to put it down, so I'm going to say negative nine millimeters and okay that switches the arrow it's nice to be able to see that feedback live and we'll click okay i mentioned before these static steps can nonlinear static steps can be a little unstable um when we're pushing this down you can think as soon as that phone hits the case it's the easiest, uh, the, the path of least resistance isn't deforming the case and slipping down it might actually be sort of skating off the side of the case so we want to limit that and i'm going to do that with a fixed displacement restraint. And I'll choose the same coupling again. There we go. 
And what I'm doing, I'm actually going to limit all translations and rotations except my Z direction, which is my up and down direction. So we're basically just forcing this. The only way it can move is directly up or directly down. And it's going to simplify things, make it a little bit more stable. Um, from there, we are pretty much ready to run this. So I will go over to my simulate tab. And there are some nice tools. If I'm, um, especially when you're getting used to the 3D experience platform, you can run a simulation check just to ensure everything's set up correctly. I'm pretty confident in this one. So I'm just gonna click the simulate button. And we'll get into something here where I can show some pretty neat features we have because I can solve this locally. I've got a fairly high powered laptop here uh, with six cores on it. So I can actually solve locally up to eight cores out of the box, but I only have six. So you see it turns red if I go above six. If I wanted to solve this faster, I can also use the cloud power. And, and that's where um, the 3D experience platform really shines. I can solve this on cloud and I can solve this with up to 144 cores if I'd like to, uh, or anywhere in between. I can solve with 36, 18, et cetera. I'm actually gonna change it. Um, well, you know what? I'm not even going to solve this right now because again, we're the point of this is not to make you guys watch a status bar. I have this already solved in another window. So let me pop this open. This is the identical model that I, uh, I have previously solved. Just gonna take a second to pop the results up. So Peter, we, we also get uh, eight cores out of the box on cloud as well. Just wanted yes. to make a quick note of that, yeah. That's completely true. You you can run without needing any, any additional credits or tokens or anything like that. You can run with eight cores locally or eight cores on cloud, and you can do that all day. You don't have to pick one or the other. You can run some locally, run some on cloud, et cetera. So here's the model. Let's actually take a look at what this looks like as it snaps down. I'll start with an animation. And hopefully the animation loads quickly. If not, I may just walk you guys through some steps on this. Now it looks like it hasn't kept that in cache. So you know what, rather than make you guys wait for this animation for it to, uh, actually it's, it's going pretty well. So we see it loading down here. We see how it's stretching the corners. We see more strain and stress in the corners than we do on the long sections. There, there's more material there to be able to stretch. We see contact stress and uh, um, essentially as the pressure builds, we're seeing that um, case strain outwards a little bit. And then we snap through and we start sliding into the case all the way down. And now we can watch it play smoothly. There we go. And it builds and builds and builds. And then we see that snap very quickly at the end. Well, I can spend a lot more time talking about this, but we want to talk about a little bit more collaboration. And let me actually just show you when we snap to the very last step here, I've got my color plot tweaked a little bit just to make those colors more visible. Um, I'm going to go, that's what I want to do, automate the colors. We can see once it actually snaps in, we're relaxed. We're very near zero stress. The maximum stress in here is like 460 pascals, but we see a little bit of stretch in the corners there. Well. In this case, I can review this with Treyas live, right? He's on the call as well. We're all looking at this. And, oh, sorry, we have a question. How would you recommend thinking about the choice of cores as a user? What should go into that thinking? Well, typically, I would always recommend try and solve with the least number of cores possible. If you're on, on cloud, you don't want to use more resources than you need to. Um, locally, I would say solve with as many cores as you have. Um, if I have eight cores, I would solve with eight cores all day, unless I had other things I needed to do. If I needed to be setting something else up, maybe I'd choose six cores, so I'd, I'd have a couple cores free for other tasks on my machine. But to get back into um, the model here, Again, we can see this live. Shreyas is on the call with me, but one thing with the 3D Experience platform, it lets us collaborate even when we're not together. And how often has that happened? If, if you're running a simulation and you go, oh man, I, I'd really like to get Bill's feedback on this or Jane's feedback on this, but they're in a meeting or they're traveling today or they're off, that's where the platform comes in. So let me actually minimize this. I'm gonna jump back into the platform now and we'll talk a little bit about how we can use platform tools to um, visualize these on the fly. So without actually needing the native app installed, again, anyone with a web browser can view these results. And we have various apps set up 
for that. Um, what you're seeing here, I've got uh, just a little dashboard I've created. And we have the 3D Play app, which is a nice viewer. It's a nice way to interact with your CAD data on the platform. But we also have something called Physics Simulation Review, which is a great way to interact with your simulation data. So how would I do this? Well, let me do a search. I'm going to search for, I called this model Live Design. So I'll search for it. I can actually unmaximize this now. I'll find the results I want, which is this one here, this phone case snap. I actually just drag that into my physics review window. And you'll see in a moment, we're going to be looking at the exact same result set I have loaded in my native app. So there we are with the corner stress on it. I can go in. I can animate this. We can see the snap through the case. Won't make you guys watch that for too much longer, but I have full control over this. I can step through to... Let me turn off my animation. I can step through to any of my different steps in here. And you can also change the way my color scheme is set. So by uh, moving those sliders, we can see that's the exact, I don't know, somewhere in there is very close to the view we were looking at. At. So we can share this, even if Shreyas wasn't even on site right now, he could be traveling. He could pull this up on a cell phone, on an iPhone or an Android phone, and actually view these results. And we can also com <clears throat> communicate through what we call swim communities. And I'll show you an example of that. Let's say that's the stress state I'd like to show. I can actually, right within this uh, physics simulation review app, go down and say publish to a 3D swim post. And this works very similarly to a social media platform uh, that, that you may be familiar with. Most people use some form of social media. I can go in and I've got this live design simulation community that I've set up here specifically uh, for this demo. I'm going to go in and let's just type a little message to Shreyas. Maybe I'll say, Shreyas, check out the results of the snap bit. And I can publish that. And what that's going to do, that's actually creating a new post on this swim community. And we'll have a look at it in a moment. Very similar to other social media platforms. I can tag people in that. So tag relevant stakeholders. I can add messages to them and things like that. Uh, people can like and share posts. Oh, you know what? I actually just see that notification. Shreyas just liked my post. And this is going to, you know, I, I would... Could click on that link. I have it already open in a tab. So you can actually see it right here. Uh, there, Shreyas has liked it. He can comment on it. And you know what? If I refresh this, it'll actually show me his comment as well. There we go. Thanks, Peter. The results look good. So that's one of the ways we can use the 3D Experience platform to communicate and collaborate back and forth. So a quick recap, we've used 3D Lean to set up the whole presentation, the workflow, the agenda, things like that. We've used the X apps and X design specifically to create that whole phone model. Then we've used some of the native apps to run the simulation on it. And then back into um, the live apps on, on the web to get this thing uh, to sort of show the results live, post it to a 3D swim community, etc. And you've noticed we've kind of jumped back and forth between native apps and the web apps seamlessly. And that's the power of the 3D experience platform. So I kind of recapped my section and I'm going to pass it over to Shreyas now to show you some really exciting stuff. So Shreyas. Yeah, sure. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, let, me, let me know once you see it, Peter. I think I can see it now. It looks very similar to my screen. Okay, sounds good. All right, so let me move this window on a different screen. Yep, that's uh, that was that was amazing, Peter. Thanks, thanks for um, you know putting together that workflow of the SnapFit. I, I think my favorite feature. Uh, was was the way you just dragged and drop your models from a web browser on a native app for all these you know complex simulation that was just crazy that was that was really awesome uh, and also the, the the collaboration aspect of the three experience platform right with with all these uh, applications the web based applications you you mentioned something like let's say I'm I'm on the road and you want to share some results with me um, all I have to have is an access to a, a cell phone a portable device with with an internet connection and I can just log in and, you know, basically stay up to date with whatever you're working on. Exactly. Yeah, uh, yeah, yep, that's that's really great. Um, so, yeah, we, we obviously covered uh, the 
X, uh, X apps to the native apps workflow, the SnapFit analysis. Let, let's switch uh, to a different gear now. Uh, I, I, I want to talk about an advanced feature that now SolidWorks users can leverage uh, with, with the availability of the 3D experience platform on all these simulation roles. So this is called the preloaded FEM feature, right? And as I, as I mentioned in the introduction, what it is, is it lets you um, lets you create a new starting point with a new deform state, new material state from an upstream analysis and let, lets you set up a downstream analysis. And the important part to highlight here is, and let me also give you, uh, explain that with a quick example here. So let's say you, you set up your upstream analysis, so something like a, a deep drawing process, a manufacturing process where you uh, do a certain step, you have a sheet metal that is, uh, uh, you know, that is being worked on. But now what you want to go ahead and do is get all the stresses that are, you know, already generated in, in that sheet metal and any um, new material state or new uh, deformed state of, of the upstream component. This feature lets you get all this data and uh, lets you set up a new downstream analysis. But the good part about this whole capability or this whole workflow is it also lets you add new components to it. A normal sequential workflow will look like where you have, uh, you're basically pointing to the stre stresses from a previous uh, step or a previous increment. But uh, the, the preloaded FEM workflow actually lets you add new uh, components to the to the downstream analysis as well. So that's what, that's, uh, yeah, that's what we're going to look in the next section. I'm going to walk you through an entire workflow on a simple model, nothing nothing too crazy, nothing too complicated. We'll, we'll drop test uh, a phone. Well, I, I actually, let me switch windows here real quick. I actually, while Peter, you were working on it, I set up a simple drop analysis. Uh, as I said, nothing, nothing too complex here. Just a block, uh, you know, a phone, uh, and then I have a floor here which I'm dropping the phone. So let me go ahead and play the animation and let's take a quick look on how it uh, actually looks like. So it, it drops off and then it, you know, had some inertia and and ricochets off the floor and you know tries to bounce off. So that is denting that bottom corner. Pretty good. I, I feel yeah. like I've done this exact same thing with my phone, and I'm cringing a little bit as I see it hit. Yeah, um, I have I have dropped my phone so many times, and uh, I'm sure uh, pretty much everyone on this call or everyone who is joining us has at least dropped his or her phone uh, at least once, right? Uh, so so it's it's always not a good feeling. But uh, let's say you're working on designing a phone body, and how do you how do you eliminate those um, uh, damages, those permanent damages? Uh, because you, you want to set up your analysis in a more realistic uh, scenario where you can you know accumulate that damage and consider the effects of multiple drops throughout the life of a cell phone right and also if i let's say if i switch uh, to somewhere here on frame nine we see the maximum stresses of about um, you know 600 megapascals so which is which is way beyond the yield of the material we're using here which is aluminum um, uh, 606 uh, right so it's obviously going to plastically deform but let's say at this point you're you're wondering okay can i can i drop it again but i when i drop it the next time what i want to have is those uh those stresses from the upstream analysis which is this one so so you're going to account for that damage, like you're going to take all the damage and the deformation from the first drop and that that will be there as you drop it a second time. So you're taking that into account. That, that, that is correct. So so what, what I'm going to do is uh, bring a preloaded step of this upstream analysis case. Uh, I'll, I'll we'll we'll walk through. Uh, I'll, I'll walk you through all, all the process, but exactly. That's exactly what I'm going to do, Peter. So uh, what I what I just did is uh, just separated the the geometry and the mesh from um, all the all the workflow that I have already set up the drop test uh, scenario that I have already set up. So uh, real quick, I have a top level assembly of meshes that Peter uh, already talked about, and I do have a couple of components here, right? Uh, I, I obviously don't need the previous one, so let's let's hide this real quick. But what I really want to do here is uh, you know bring in that. 
uh, bring in that preloaded frame. So we have this automated frame, which Peter used the user-driven uh, approach using that automated frame, and I'm using the preloaded frame approach. So all I have to do is search for the upstream analysis, right? In this case, I've already opened it in, in a in, in a previous tab, so I go back there and just point to the physics simulation object, the top level physics simulation object uh, in the feature tree, right? Um, and it, it basically asks me a couple of things here. Okay, which structural analysis case do you want to bring in? So in, in, in this case, I only have one structural analysis case, so I select uh, structural analysis case one, I can say, hey, okay, uh, look, the explicit dynamic step that I have set up there is is something um, I'll be um, I'll, I'll be I'll be using, and uh, I do have the option to specify what increments do I bring my results from, right? Do I uh, let's say and there were fifteen increments, right? So I, I I can you know let's say the tenth one or the eleventh one is what I want, so. I'll probably specify that. If not, the more realistic situation uh, scenario would be to bring in results from your last increments. Um, so yeah, that's that's what we do. You can always include constraints. Uh, go ahead and hit OK. So it will bring constraints over as well from that, that first analysis? That's correct. So let's say if, if you have uh, any constraints that you want to use in the downstream analyses, uh, use them or apply any boundary conditions there you can you can obviously do that so you, oh that's nice you don't have to set the whole thing up again correct you 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 don't really have to uh, mess around with the uh, upstream model um, at all so uh, let's start with the uh, by renaming this i'm just going to say uh, preloaded frame i've already worked on a few uh, and just yeah just type in 9 which is the latest one uh, ignore ignore my laziness, folks. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> preloaded fam nine, which is the latest one, which we know. And if I highlight, let me zoom in on the feature tree here a bit. If if we highlight uh, or if we uh, expand this preloaded fam, so what it has done is it obviously brought in uh, the nodes and elements from from the upstream analysis, but not everything uh, is 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 what I need. So for example, I don't need the surface cord mesh on the floor. I don't need um, the clamp uh, clamp node where it, it basically got automatically created, so I can obviously get rid of those. We're um, going to set up a new floor, right? Uh, I'm sorry. That's why you're deleting those. You're deleting those because you want to create another. We're going to drop it at a different angle, right? Correct. Yeah. So okay. you, yeah, you're basically going to drop it at a different angle, and this is this is the this is the USP of of this uh, whole workflow, right? You. It lets you not only get the data from a, from any increment from an upstream analysis, but it also lets you create new components. Let lets you add new components to it, and we'll we'll be seeing this uh, how you can add a new component in just a bit here. So up until now, what I did is just just uh, reference or just brought in that preloaded fem, and it it has a preloaded state. So anytime. Uh, and again, there's there's a there's a connection that is maintained between the downstream and the upstream analyses. So let's say now I decide to go back and drop the phone at a different velocity or a different angle, right? So a new set of preloaded fem uh, can be generated by just you know coming to a downstream analysis and then just uh, you know uh, clicking the update button. I think we just got one more question in the chat here, Shreyas, and um, we've got a question. How could this actually inform the design of your end result product? And if I'm interpreting that correctly, kind of wondering how this is useful, how this is going to affect our design decisions. Um, there's multiple ways that this could help. And um, one of the, the more obvious ways is including stresses from manufacturing processes, because when we start designing parts um, or, or simulating parts, very often if we're doing a sheet metal design or something formed or stamped, we'll start with the geometry and apply material to it and start running it. But that kind of assumes that we have a zero strain state at um, with our model. Like you get this form geometry, it might be a bent sheet metal bracket or a stamped metal part or a cast part, something like that. Um, we often kind of ignore the pre-stress from that manufacturing process. So one thing this can do is actually include that by simulating the manufacturing process. We can start with the same geometry, but with all the pre-stress and stiffening, hardening, et cetera, that's been, been built into that through those previous steps. But anytime you have a sequential analysis, it doesn't have to be a manufacturing process. Anytime you have 
something that's causing some permanent deformation, or even if it's not permanent deformation, anywhere you, you want to include some preload, pre-strain, plastic deformation, elastic deformation, etc. Anytime you want to include that in a further downstream analysis, that's where this can really come in useful. And you're, you're basically getting more realistic results when you're con exactly. uh, considering all, all your um, preconditions from an upstream analysis, right? So it, 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 you should be able to correlate uh, well with your physical testing. And that's, that's the whole goal um, here with the preloaded FEM workflow. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, while, while Peter was answering uh, that question, and thanks, Peter, uh, what I did is I opened a new tab, created a new physical product, right? We don't, we don't want to uh, keep our downstream analyses or uh, you know, confuse our downstream analyses with our upstream analyses. So let's start clean with the downstream analysis. So what I did is created a new physical product. And uh, what I'm gonna do is just point uh, the previous physical product and bring in this new physical product that I just created, which is 4368, okay? Um, and then you can obviously see a lot of a uh, lot of components uh, in in this physical product, which we obviously don't need. So what uh, what I'm going to do here is just hide them. Uh, all we we care about right now in this downstream simulation is this uh, preloaded FEM nine. And if I zoom in a bit here, right, you can obviously see the difference between this corner. And I know the mesh is you know a lot of course, uh, and that's uh, probably why we also wanted to you know show or demonstrate how how uh, what state this new preloaded FEM comes in. So there's there's some deformation that we can obviously see here on this particular corner, which, which the phone dropped, right? Okay, so the next step, as I said, we can create components on the fly, we can add. So let's say if I had, uh, uh, if, if I already have a ground created and stored somewhere in my collaborative space, I can obviously point to that. But the good part is I can also go ahead and create something on the fly. So let's maybe try doing that here real quick. Um, I created another physical product, a 3D part within the top level physical product. Okay. Um, so I, I, what it does is automatically sets up a 3D shape with you know certain planes. Um, so let me double click on it and I switch to the simulation model preparation app. So this is where I can, uh, I have access to all these features, so de-featuring tools, I can create, idealize um, multiple things. Uh, so if, if I want to create a new plane that is offset to let's say plane XY, and maybe we wanna offset it below so that this time we drop it on the bottom face rather than the rather than the edge, right? So maybe let me create some gap here. Let's see, yeah, we do have some gaps, so that is okay. And uh, yeah, that's 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 pretty much it. So I, once I've created that plane, I can now go ahead and maybe sketch a quick uh, rectangle, centered rectangle, in the similar manner we could have done it in SolidWorks. So I do that, let me exit out of this. So it created a wireframe, right? Um, now I, I do need a 2D surface there. So what I can do is, um, you can say, okay, it already selected the, the um, outer uh, wireframe that I just created, and then I'm gonna fill it with the surface. So everything I, that I worked, um, not just in the simulation model prep app, but in any apps, right? Model assembly design, be it mechanical scenario creation, all the features that I work uh, on, it auto-populates in the feature tree on the left-hand side. So something similar to what we have in SolidWorks and also in the X apps, Peter, right? So, so yes. I, I have access, I can just double click and edit it if, if I wish to. Okay, so now that I have this ground, and let me rename this here real quick so that we uh, we know what, what this is about. So I'm gonna call it floor symbol. Okay, all right, um, what do we do next? So we, we we already have a mesh uh, in, in, in the form of, you know, the preloaded uh, 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 finite element model that we brought, but we don't really have a mesh on the floor. So what I'm gonna do is, uh, add a new finite element model, insert a new finite element model within this floor geometry, right? And if I double click on it, it gives me option to mesh um, this, this particular you know, ground that I just created. So let's uh, quickly do a surface called mesh. We don't really care about um, this mesh being, um, 
you know, super fine. Let's let's keep it co as coarse as we can. Um, anyways, what I'm going to do is um, maybe apply like surface selection properties with uh, with some random value for density, a very high value, okay? Because uh, the whole goal is to fix this and make it a rigid body. We don't really care about the stresses on the flow, right? All we care about uh, the 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 geometry of the phone and what are the stresses there. So uh, yeah, let's go ahead and select this. I'm going to put it to center of mass and yeah, without specifying anything further, we'll we'll just go ahead and hit okay. So what do we do next? Uh, we have the preloaded fem. We have uh, we cr we created a ground on fly. We meshed it, right? Let's uh, let's maybe go back to the top level model assembly design. I yeah, let me we turn on the visualization on this. Okay, this looks good. So we have everything that we needed. Um, all right, so let's now start setting up uh, another drop test, right? So obviously the previous results came in, but the previous procedures uh, won't won't come in as as is because again we we want to set up a different scenario, so we don't really want want those previous procedures uh, or the previous steps that we boundary conditions that we have set up. So I'm going to select the top level physical product. Uh, yeah, these are all my applications. As Peter mentioned, these are all the roles that I have access to. Um, I have the fluid dynamics engineer, durability roles, uh, all the structures roles. And mechanical scenario creation is something that I, I want to use to set up this model. So that's the same app I was using earlier, right? And uh, we're doing two very different types of analyses, but that is using the same app. To do it. Yes, correct. That's that's basically the same app that you use to set this model up. Uh, sorry, not this model, but the snap. The previous model, model, yeah. And will you set that up? I um, th there may be some people out there. If you, if you haven't done any drop testing before, uh, you might be looking at this going. Well, that's not a very big drop. I've dropped my cell phone from ten times that high before, or <laughs> fifty times that high. Um, the distance doesn't really matter. We'll be applying an initial velocity. We'll be saying how fast the phone's moving, rather than than physically watching it fall through all that height. If if, uh, if <laughs> but for anyone that's done some drop testing before, you're well aware of this, and this looks totally normal. Yeah. Correct. So I'm uh, just going to name, uh, give, give the simulation a name, and then we have different analysis type to select from. So we'll, uh, this is going to be a structural analysis case, so we'll um, put that option to structures. Now, we don't really have um, a way where we are telling the software, okay, these are all the mesh uh, mesh on different components that I wish to include in the in the in the analysis. So what I'm going to do is something similar to what Peter did, and and thanks for uh, um, giving me that idea, Peter. Otherwise, I was going to try a different approach. Uh, but this is this is really good. So what I'm going to do is set up a, a assembly of meshes, uh, an empty mesh. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and hit OK, which is 1602 uh, finite element model 1602. Now. If I uh, double click on the mesh that I just created, the top level, um, you know, assembly of mesh, it'll ask me, okay, which components do I wish to include it in, in our simulation? Now, obviously I, I want to include the ground, but I don't really want to include the previous model. So I'll go ahead and hit okay. Um, let's see, where's our preloaded frame? Let me turn on the visualization on that. Okay, so if I go to setup, now if I go to contributing ships manager, here's where uh, things can get a bit tricky. So I, I obviously have 1602, which is my assembly of meshes, the top level um, you know, uh, assembly, which will reference all the individual meshes that I wish to include. So uh, for the phone drop, right, I can say, okay, the, the preloaded FEM9, which is the latest one that I you know brought in, is something that I, I wish to include, okay? So as soon as I click, uh, that I let's see that included in the uh, physics simulation. For the floor, I did set up a mesh 1601, so I'll you know bring in that as well. Um, and that's that's really what we want, right? I said we, we're gonna keep things simple, nothing complex, super simple components, and you know just a just a second drop test, a drop test after we already had an upstream drop test, and as you can see, this is some deform uh, you know elements here as well. Okay, uh, so with that done, let's switch back to the mechanical scenario creation, right? 
we do have uh, our structural analysis case set up. Uh, what about the procedures though? Uh, yeah, let's let's use the explicit dynamic uh, step, and I'm going to run this for a super super small time. Uh, 0 0.003 seconds. And an important thing to note here would be, so let's say this is my second drop, right? This is uh, my downstream analysis. I'm dropping it for the second time with all the stresses from the uh, previous um, analysis case. But let's say if I want to drop it the third time, right? Or, or just set up a different analysis altogether. What I have to do is I have to make sure that I use this continuation data that is um, uh, turned on so that it tells the software, okay, that there, uh, this, this is going to be the data generated from this uh, simulation is going to be used in another downstream analysis case. Um, with other options set, set to default, we'll hit OK. Um, initial conditions, uh, we already have that with the preloaded FEM. Interactions, yeah, Peter already showed you some uh, interesting capabilities of, of um, uh, uh, the, the 3D experience platform, one of which was the general contact technology. Now, if you are familiar with Abacus, if you have used Abacus in the past, this is something you can uh, totally relate to. So general contact is basically, uh, I, I don't really have to, you know, work a lot around it. Uh, if, if I have to keep things simple in this particular case, so I'm just gonna use the general contact, which is a way of telling the software that, okay, hey, look, this there's gonna be some contact between um, the components I have in during the simulation. So this general contact would take care of, you know, the contact uh, that, that takes place during the simulation. But the good part about this particular feature is, let's say I have, uh, I have tens and hundreds of components that come in contact during the simulation. So I don't have to necessarily go and define each individual contact uh, prior to I run this simulation, the general contact feature will take care of it. And you can obviously go ahead and specify uh, certain contact properties and make the contacts more realistic. Okay, uh, so once that is done, and yeah, as I as I mentioned, everything that you work on gets populated in the feature tree. So if, if you have to go back and edit, you can you know access those uh, uh, features that you've worked on from the feature tree. Okay, uh, how about some boundary conditions? We obviously want to want to clamp, uh, you know, the floor. So what I'm going to do is uh, clamp the rigid body that we created, right? Uh, either I can do it from the um, on on fly from from the support option, or I can go to the feature tree and I can say, hey, look, this this my rigid body. Just select um, that, and then it, it'll, it'll clamp the rigid body. Okay, the next thing I may want to do is, you know what, I have to apply initial velocity, right? Um, so the, the stresses were obviously came in, the, the inertia on, on the preloaded frame is also there. But let's say in this case, I want to go ahead and apply certain uh, initial velocity to, to the uh, you know preloaded frame or any uh, mesh that came in through the preloaded frame. Now, one way to do this would be a uh, this, there's all these groups that automatically were, uh, you know, imported when I brought in the preloaded frame. So what I can do is I can say, hey, I want to apply an initial velocity, but I can obviously select one of the groups. Now, an interesting uh, capability of this feature is all the boundary conditions in an upstream analysis that you have worked on, it, it automatically detects and creates groups. So uh, which are basically something similar to sets if you're using Abacus, right? Uh, but yeah, the, the, the groups are, uh, it, 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 it has grouped all the nodes that the initial velocity was applied on. So it, it makes my life a lot easier. All I have to do is just select or, uh, you know, point to that initial velocity, um, which then initial velocity group, which then select all those nodes within the, that group. And I can say, hey, I want to apply, let's maybe apply um, a, a super high velocity of about 30 meter uh, per second. But obviously, we don't want to flat. We don't want to make the phone <laughs> That would be a funny analysis to watch. It would just so this is yeah. This is more like it. Yeah. Um, all right. So that being done, um, I think yeah. That's that's all the setup, right? I 
I, I, I think said that's this, it. Uh, in the past as well. We're keeping things simple, not not too crazy uh, designs, or you know, even the setup is simple. So the feature manager is a good way to review everything. And if if I want, so let's say I don't really care about the global virtual output here, I can I can create multiple field outputs, multiple history outputs. But at this time, really, what what it, what we have is we have a clamp. I have set up a general contact, and then I have some initial velocity as well, right? That looks great. Okay, uh, and yeah, that's that's really pretty much the setup I wanted to show. Uh, Peter already talked about um, how we can simulate this, right? Um, we we do have options to use the um, cloud resources, right? Uh, so right now the role I'm um, I'm using is the structural mechanics engineer role. I don't have uh, any durability module here, but the this this particular role basically. Um, um, you know, comes in with the simulation model, and we'll we'll get to that, and then uh, once we are concluding the session. But but basically, this is this is all the setup I wanted to show you. So you can obviously get results from the downstream analysis, which, as I said, you can go ahead and create multiple drop tests and sequence, or just all together get your results, get your preloaded frame from this particular downstream analysis, and um, you know maybe take it to a different type of analysis altogether. Sorry, are right. we solving this live? Yes, I, I actually, while I was talking, I clicked the solve button. And as you can see, it's it's cranking up uh, already, and it's already yeah, eighty percent. So it's going super fast. Uh, I know we are at the top of the R, but we do have a few things uh, just before we go. So uh, yeah, as, let me let me show yeah. you quick results as this is almost finished. It's extracting the results. If anybody uh, can, does have to jump off, they can. This will be live on or uh, recorded on YouTube, so uh, so no rush. Let's let's finish what we're what we're planning on showing, and anybody yeah. who needs to leave can yeah. can check it out later on. Yeah. So so if I if I go to the first step, Peter, you can obviously see the pr uh, stresses that already existed in the model, and it yep. also has some inertia. So uh, when I drop this, it it actually drops it. In a, in a certain way and certain and then it bounces off it bounces uh, off uh, in well, a because of the inertia because it brought in the inertia from that previous step so it's kind of it's got that um, it's already got some of that motion built in that's cool yep yep all right, so that's that's pretty much it as far as the preloaded frame workflow is concerned uh, let's go back to uh, wow. the agenda slide so yeah we, we obviously saw uh, you know Peter's workflow. I, I just uh, concluded my workflow. Uh, we'll do nice work, Trey. Sorry, before you just wanted to say, great job on that. You showed off some pretty powerful capabilities and showed it live um, and solved it live in in what twenty minutes, something like that. So that's um, I'm yeah, I'm pretty impressed. I haven't it's, used it's the preloaded It's a very user friendly tool. Yeah, to be honest, uh, if 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 you if you spend you know just. Uh, a few hours with the tool, you'll you'll basically start you know picking up things and you'll uh, it'll, it'll speed up your workflows. If you are a SolidWorks uh, simulation user, if you are a SolidWorks user, uh, that that's that's always going to help you. But if you have no experience with uh, the 3D Experience platform, it, it's it's designed in such a way it's uh, very user friendly and very easy to understand with all these collaboration aspects uh, you know attached with the platform as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so to conclude real quick. Uh, as I said, the, the structural solution that we, we were working with is the structural mechanics engineer. I don't really, you know, want to go into too much detail on, you know, some, uh, you know, what are the exact and what are uh, all the capabilities. But yeah, it obviously comes with the explicit uh, solve explicit dynamic step. It lets you solve explicit scenarios. Uh, this is the abacus solver that we get. Obviously, the geometry preparation, simulation model preparation application also comes in with the material calibration app. So let's say uh, you are someone who is working a lot with custom materials, right? You're testing out different different materials in a lab environment, and you want to simulate those materials. Uh, using the 3D experience platform, what you get to do is with the material calibration app, you get to bring in that data and using different material models that are already inbuilt, you get to calibrate uh, the data that you bring in and then set up new materials altogether. But yeah, this is the top level offering that that uh, that we were working with the structural mechanics engineer. But yeah, we we do have um, you know some entry level roles like structural designer, structural engineer, structural performance engineer, and obviously the fatigue model is something that is flexible. You can add it with the structural performance or a structural mechanics engineer. 
And then I think that's if we could stay on that for just one second. Yeah, sure. Um, I think it is important to know what those different packages are kind of for. Um, we won't go into detail on all of them. That information is is out there and available, but. Um, you may not need the flagship sort of top of the line simulation package if you just need some basic linear static analysis but would still like the same collaborative capabilities we have some of those entry level um, uh, simulation roles that are available to you so and even within the same organization not everybody has to be on the same role depending on what types of projects you're working on you might get some engineers working with some products some engineers working with other products and, and we can support that mix Okay, thanks. That's all I wanted to mention. And yeah, the talk. If if we if you are interested in um, CFD solutions, we do have another role again on the 3D experience platform, which is called the fluid dynamics engineer role. Um, and again, it's since it's on the 3D experience platform, you also get the cloud compute option with the, uh, this particular role as well. And uh, again, here you can also go all the way to 144 cores. Uh, it, it communicates well with all the different applications on the 3D experience platform, all the all the collaborative applications as well. And yeah, that's that's uh, if if you're interested in this, uh, we, would, we would highly encourage you to reach out to your uh, reseller, and uh, you know they'll they'll be able to guide you um, on on these roles. But yeah, we do have uh, electromagnetic solution. I'll, I'll let Peter uh, speak and give you more information on the electromagnetic solutions that uh, SolidWorks users now have, the advanced electromagnetic solutions. I should say. Definitely, and I'll be happy to talk to that. I Before we do, we have one more question in the chat, which is what about composites? Do we have capabilities to work with composites? And yes, we do. Um, inside the material, uh, we, we didn't have a chance to really show off the material library or the material um, material options that much today, but there are definitely models for fiber reinforced composites uh, or, or composites, sorry, my Canadian is showing on this. Yeah, composites, oh, yeah, that's com a, composites, that's a, whatever that's a, you'd like to uh, to say, we do have that capability. Correct. Yeah, that's a very good question, actually. we So so the way uh, these features are bundled, right? So let me go back real quick uh, to this particular slide. So the way these applications are bundled within these roles are based on their capabilities, right? So it's it's very flexible. It's completely up to you on you know what feature. For example, right now uh, there was a question on composite. So you let's say you don't really care about fatigue, or you don't really care about other applications, right? Other um, uh, capabilities. So all you have to do is just go uh, for the composites package. Uh, you know that 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 uh, we have to offer. So it's it's as I said, it's completely flexible and it's completely up to you which package you want to choose or which models you want to choose. Sorry, Peter. Yeah, go ahead with that. Oh, hey, no problem. So electromagnetics is one of the simulation areas that I I don't think we spend enough time talking about because people are, are I think, well aware that we have lots of options for structural simulation and fluid simulation, both in SolidWorks, uh, sort of on the desktop, as well as on the 3D experience platform. But a lot of people aren't aware of our electromagnetic capabilities. And it's a shame because they are absolutely world-class capabilities. And this is something I just got into recently. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer by background, so I, I don't have a, a super deep um, electromagnetics knowledge, but I'm quite surprised how quickly I can pick this up. Um, so what we have in the Simulia electromagnetics package, uh, there's a package called electromagnetics, um, uh, electromagnetics engineer. Uh, and what that does, well, the, what is the trigram for that? EMCOC, actually. Oh, you can see that at the top of the screen. It covers simulation um, of, of just about any frequency range you can think of, from low frequency devices like electric motors, um, electric motors, high power devices, things like that that are fairly low frequency, up into uh, communication devices, microwave and RF antennas, antenna placement, near field and far field analysis tying those into the circuits that drive them as well, and full capabilities around PCB, um, design and electronics as well. So signal integrity, power integrity analysis, um, getting into electromagnetic compatibility, which is a big thing as well, especially as we're getting more and more handheld devices and wearables out there. Um, you need to be able to check not only the, that they won't interfere with other, other devices, but also check that the emissions are within spec for what we call specific absorption rates. So sort of the, the amount of um, 
the amount of radiation you get when you're holding a phone up to your head or when you're wearing a um, wearing a phone on your watch and, and uh, in the case of a smartwatch, etc., all the way up to very high end applications like particle dynamics. So I won't spend too much longer on that, but I think the main message we want to convey is if you have any questions about the 3D experience platform, if you'd like to learn more about it, please go to the SolidWorks website um, because, uh, or the um, uh, Dassault website. Because what we have here is actually a huge uh, 3D Experience Works page with a huge amount of information on there. And if we can just take a quick scroll down that maybe, you can see various different videos, uh, information about various packages, things like that. It's um, all right there. And the other thing you can do is talk to your SolidWorks reseller or so reseller in your area. They would be happy to provide more information. Um, that's pretty much it. If you're interested in learning more, please reach out because we are happy to provide more information to you. And I think we'd like to finish this by just giving a little bit of a plug to the next live design session, right? Can we, um, and that's something I'm not going to show. I think on the back end, one of the YouTube producers here can put up that slide. The next session that we have is going to be on October 28th. And uh, please join us later that month, live on YouTube, October 28th. Superstar designer Kate Reed is going to be joining us on live design to show us how she merges nature and reality through algorithmic 3D design. And again, be sure to subscribe, hit the notification bell to keep up with our ups upcoming streams like the one you just watched. And um, one more thing, guys, if you're interested in 3D Experience World, if anyone's been before, it used to be called SolarArts World, now with the branding as 3D Experience World, it's happening in Nashville in February this year. It's one of the best conferences I've ever been to in my life. I've been there, oh, uh, I think I've been to six or seven of them over my career. Um, anyways, that page is up live now. So you can go in, you can check out the agenda and what's going on with um, uh, 3D Experience World 2023 in Nashville, and you can also register. So be sure to check that out as well. And I think finally, uh, Shreyas, we should probably just thank everyone for joining oh, yeah. us. Yeah, thank you, today. thank you everyone for tuning in today. We really appreciate ha having you guys, uh, and yeah, hope hope you found this session exciting, interesting. And as Peter mentioned, if you're if you're interested in learning more, please reach out to your nearest reseller, and they should be able to you know um, get you get you all set and running. Excellent. All right, guys. Well, thank you very much, and, and uh, we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.